So, um, so what I'll do, I will introduce uh, the, uh, the system and tell you how we can actually build uh, arrays of control, controlled um, uh, qubits, you know, based on individually trapped neutral atoms. And I will um, uh, also uh, show you how we can use this system to perform, for example, multi-qubit logic operations or to uh, engineer large scale entanglement. And then in the last maybe 10 minutes or so, I will tell you about the kind of things which we are working on now, which involve scaling this system to much larger arrays in two dimensions and uh, employing this both for uh, studying many body physics and uh, to testing some uh, quantum optimization algorithms. So in our approach, as I already mentioned, we utilized cold neutral atoms, which are trapped individually using the so-called optical tweezers, which are basically uh, tightly focused beams of light. And we focus this beam so tightly that at most each tweezer can uh, host one atom. And uh, so what we do in each experimental run, we don't start with one tweezer, but we start with a large number of them. And then we just try to load them simultaneously. And this loading is not perfect. So a system like this has an entropy. And what we do to basically eliminate this entropy is we uh, just take a picture of atoms and uh, remove the empty traps and then basically arrange the entire atoms in a desired configuration. After that, we can interrogate these uh, um, uh, uh, atoms with lasers, similar to what uh, Chris talked about this morning. But to make them interact, we actually excite these atoms into this uh, uh, so-called Rydberg states, the states with high principal quantum number, in such a way that the atoms, atoms which are separated by even few microns can interact extremely strong. And this is uh, our effort within Harvard MIT Center for Ultra Cold Atoms is a collaboration with Vlad and Wuletic and Markus Greiner's group. So here is uh, the kind of just uh, uh, simple kind of uh, high level overview of the first generation of our experimental apparatus. So remember that because I will kind of tell you about a second generation towards the end of my talk. And so the key in this apparatus is this acoustic optic deflector, this device which takes as an input microwave uh, or radio frequency tones and actually outputs arrays of laser beams. And basically then what we do is we focus these arrays in a vacuum chamber and then we have two objectives. One is to basically project the straps and another one is to basically take pictures of atoms to basically figure out which traps are full and which are empty. And then what we do is we take a picture, activate a feedback loop. And then what we can do is basically kind of, you know, um, do things like this. We first take a picture, for example, here of about 100 tweezers and they are filled with certain probability close to 60%. And then what we do, we just move each atom to form a kind of much more regular array. So uh, this uh, uh, is the actually experimental team which originally built this uh, system. So many of the members already now are kind of uh, prominent uh, scientists on their own, have their own groups like Manuel and and Hannes in particular. So uh, in order to control interactions as uh, induce and control interactions, as I already discussed, we excite atoms into the Rydberg states. And the reason why we like the Rydberg states is because they combine very, very long lifetimes, like you know, more than hundreds of microseconds and very strong interactions. So in fact, the interaction for high principal quantum number n scales like 11th power of n. And so what it means that if you excite, for example, the atoms into the state with n equals 100, then the Van der Waal interaction between the atoms will be 14 orders of magnitude stronger than the interaction between ground state atoms. So 14 orders of magnitude is a big number and we can make good use of that. So one uh, specific approach which we like to use is the idea of Rydberg blocking. So that's the idea which actually we developed with uh, Ignacio and Peter you know, almost 20 years ago. And the idea is basically the following. So if you take two atoms and, you know, for example, try to excite them into Rydberg state resonantly, if they are very far away, then they will be undergoing individual radio oscillations. But if you bring these atoms close, then eventually this interaction, this very strong interaction will take over and basically for atoms within the so-called um, Rydberg blockade radius, so, you know, you can simply not excite both of them simultaneously. You can excite one atom or another, 
but never uh, two of them at once. So this gives rise to this effect of Friedberg blockade, the simultaneous excitation is blocked. It turns out to be a very effective mechanism to entangle atoms because it's insensitive to position atoms, you know, so long as they are within blockade, it's insensitive to motion and all sorts of other things. And so basically what follows, I will be showing some pictures which basically will involve first, you know, starting with random uh, kind of randomly filled traps, first in one dimensions and then two dimensions, and then basically preparing these kind of uh, arrangements of atoms. So for example, in this case, these are the blocks of, I guess, six, and then subjecting them to various kinds of laser pulses. And then at the end, reading atoms in a, in a certain internal state, you know, so pushing, you know, for example, you know, uh, you know, kind of, um, uh, some you know of the states you know out of the trap and then just measuring the, the remaining atoms as is shown here. So uh, and kind of it's the approach and basically within this platform over the last couple of years you know our group and also others have actually done a number of uh, experiments which basically involve both quantum information processing but also quantum simulations and among the things which we have done is We've carried out experiments on high fidelity entanglement and also parallel multi-qubit uh, quantum gates. So for example, what's shown is a uh, kind of measured truth table of Toffoli gate. So it's actually, it has still some substantial error, but it turns out it's one of the very best which has ever been done in any systems. So, but we've also done um, um, uh, a lot of work on exploring novel quantum phase transition, exploring quantum dynamics, and also kind of probing large scale entanglement. And the point which I'd like to emphasize here is all of these points are very closely connected. You know, this, this, all of these things are, um, are linked uh, with each other. So uh, basically, you know, uh, improving, uh, for example, you know, quantum simulations, which often use kind of analog dynamics, you know, helps us to actually kind of, you know, make digital circuits better and the other way around. And actually what's important is that in this NISC era, you know, you want to deploy the best techniques possible. So in fact, often analog devices turn out to work better than digital devices. So uh, let me just uh, uh, kind of uh, give one example of that is when we employed the system to use quantum simulations of spin models. So basically here, what we do is we prepare a string of these atoms, you know, with let's say equal uh, separation, equal distance, and encode qubits in the ground and Rydberg states, right? So it's either the atom in the ground state or the atoms in the, exc in the excited in one of the Rydberg states. And then basically, you know, this is two state system, so you can write an effective spin Hamiltonian and basically this spin Hamiltonian uh, is shown here. So it can be actually, to understand what's going on, we can characterize it using the, uh, the ground state phase diagram. And what is uh, axis is here are detuning is basically that this term is a laser detuning and then the interaction range. And, uh, uh, you know, like first, if we, for example, neglect the interaction. So what's clear is that, you know, whether, you know, the change should be in the lowest electronic state or in the Rydberg state will depend very much on the sign of detuning. So if the detuning is negative, then you would like to have all atoms to be in the ground electronic state. But if you flip the sign, you would like to have all at, uh, atoms to be in the uh, Rydberg state. But state like this, you know, shown for example, in, on, on the right here, uh, that violates uh, blockade constraints. So if you turn the interactions and if the interaction range is, uh, is small such that you're blocked basically with nearest neighbors. So what will happen is you will not be able to access the state with all atom excited. So the best, you know, what you can do, you can um, uh, create a state where every second atom is excited. That's the so-called uh, uh, kind of uh, anti-ferromagnetic state, or you could say that's a state with G2 broken symmetry. It's just up, down, up, down, up, down. Now, if you actually increase the interaction range, then you will not be able to excite also second nearest neighbor. So the state you will create has Z-free symmetry broken and, and it goes on. And uh, the way how you can explore this uh, phase diagram is by basically um, uh, just starting with all atoms in the ground state and just changing the detuning, the laser detuning kind of slowly to try to adiabatically enter all of these phases. 
And so that's uh, uh, what we have done a couple of years ago. And basically one readily then sees how all of these uh, kind of orders uh, emerge. And so basically with these different uh, cases here is we excited the same Rydberg state, but what we have done, we just created uh, traps where the atoms are stacked closer and closer together. So here on the nearest neighbor is blocked. So it's up, down, up, down, up, down state. Here is second nearest neighbor blocked. It's uh, up, down, down, up, down, down, and so on. And, and it, it, it continues. And what you see here is that you scan detuning basically kind of around the detuning equal to zero. You know, you have a lot of fluctuations and it's basically when system does not know which state uh, 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 to choose, so we can really study this kind of simple uh, uh, quantum phase transitions in this model. So, uh, but you know, what's kind of really interesting is to go to much larger system size and you know, uh, uh, in our first experiments, uh, it's already kind of almost three years ago, actually two and a half, we uh, uh, looked at a system which had 51 atoms and you know so here is the uh, array of this 51 atom string you know before we have uh, done this transition and now let's kind of set um, the distance uh, such that uh, we basically have only nearest neighbor blockaded so we should create a z2 state but typically when if one just does a ramp across this transition, you do not get a perfectly ordered state. You get this kind of long streaks up, down, up, down, up, down. And there is a kind of a defect. This is basically a domain wall, you know, and then there is another string. And one can analyze now this kind of uh, phase transition by using thermodynamic quantities, for example, density of domain walls or variance of domain walls, the fluctuations. And what one sees is that is basically really like a classic signature of the Ising of the of the second order phase transition in one dimensions where the kind of order parameter changes smoothly, but these fluctuations, you know, peak uh, just around the phase transition point. And this is exactly because system cannot decide in which state it wants to be in this case. And so basically, you know, um, in this very first experiment, so we basically already have kind of were able to kind of nail down this phase transition point and it turns out to be in a good agreement with theoretical predictions by our condensed matter uh, uh, colleagues by Subir Sajdif and, and co-authors. But there is much more we can do. So we can also look at this kind of um, uh, phase transition microscopically right? because we can measure each individual atom. And what we can do here, is we can look at the basically probability of each microscopic you know, uh, state, you know, occurring. And so, in fact, sometimes we would get this up, down, up, down, up, down, perfectly ordered state. And in this very first uh, experiments, it occurred, you know, with finite probability, but actually, you know, pretty small. But nevertheless, this state really here stands out. And in fact, you know, what I'll show you in a second is that by now we improve the system such that we can create the states with actually pretty high, uh, you know, probability. So we can, you know, really quantify and benchmark the system a little bit in this way. We can also look at things like density density of correlators, of course, and basically what it really shows that you we have, you know, uh, kind of unique set of tools to really kind of get um, uh, very interesting insights into the physics of quantum phase transition, in particular into quantum dynamics. And so this is actually what we have been doing for the past, you know, couple of years. So we have studied, for example, uh, you know, critical phenomena, exploiting for, uh, things like quantum kibble zurich mechanism. We've also started uh, studied uh, non-equilibrium dynamics, you know, where we would actually, um, you know, uh, push the system quickly across the uh, phase transition and see how it uh, formalizes. And actually, in fact, in these experiments, I would say that we made already one of the first kind of discoveries, real discoveries with quantum machine. We have found some trajectories which are non-formalizing and is by now known under this name quantum many body scars. And actually uh, this is now a very active theoretical um, frontier where people try to understand when these many body scars occurs, what's exactly their nature uh, and so on. So it's actually a very cool kind of new field. But what I'd like to do uh, today kind of in the spirit of this, uh, you know, discussions which we have is I'd like to basically, you know, explore if this kind of uh, approach can be used to benchmark quantum system. And one way to kind of benchmark is to create uh, a large scale entangled state. And so in particular, 
one paradigmatic state is this kind of cat state, Schrodinger cat state or GG state, where it's basically a superposition of you know, all qubits in one state and you know, all qubits in a kind of an orthogonal state. So these kind of states are important because on one hand, they're actually maximally sensitive to decoherence. So if you can create this state, you really know that your system works very well. They're also a resource for things like error correction and communication and metrology, but also these states are very relatively easy to characterize. So basically all you need to know, you need to know basically uh, two diagonal and two of diagonal elements of a density matrix, you know, uh, of them and, and qubit density matrix as shown here. So from those, you can um, uh, uh, put together this quantity called fidelity, basically overlap with perfect state and actually in fact, you can show that if this fidelity is larger than one half, this is sufficient for n particle entanglement. So how do we create the state? So we will use these um, adiabatic sweeps, and, uh, 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 but we will use the even number of atoms. So in this case, if you do the adiabatic sweep, then uh, basically you should create the state, which is a superposition of up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, up. Actually, in practice, it turns out that you know if you just do that, you would also have some substantial admixture of both Friedberg atoms on the edges. So this state has very similar energy. So we don't want this admixture. And what we do is basically we just apply like local magnetic field. In fact, you know, effectively what we do, we actually apply uh, laser beams to this um, uh, edge atoms to basically push this state uh, out of the resonance. And then what we do is just we perform the sweep. And for the system of four atoms, for example, you know, this uh, all of the states are well resolved. So you can just do that and you can uh, measure then the, um, the uh, qubits in a computational basis, measuring probability of both of these states. And indeed, with high probability, you have either up, down, up, down, or down, up, down, up. And you can also, uh, to, to measure of diagonal elements, you need to rotate the basis and basically, uh, you know, uh, and, and measure um, uh, them in a different basis. But what specifically you'd like to do, you'd like to verify the phase. And, you know, in order to verify the phase, you need to control the phase. And we do it by applying a staggered magnetic field, which basically applies a magnetic field to every other atom. And it actually, results in a phase uh, which is picked up between these two different components. And then, you know, to measure this, we just rotate the, uh, rotate the basis and measure parity, and then we can have the fringe and we can extract fidelity. Right, so it works very well for, for atoms, but actually if you go to a slightly larger system, like for example, eight atoms, what you see already start seeing this kind of spaghetti here. And uh, basically you can still try to do adiabatic, uh, uh, Pulse, but it actually becomes very, very challenging. So at this point, um, we uh, teamed up with our colleagues in, uh, uh, in uh, Germany uh, and uh, we used uh, one of the optimal control kind of uh, techniques developed by Tamasas and Simona's um, uh, group. And actually this optimal control technique, while it does not necessarily change any kind of scaling, it actually does really result in Kind of practical improvement. So, in fact, you know, from through this, we found some kind of non-trivial pulses, and actually, it results in trajectories which are non, not perfectly adiabatic, but still result in substantial speed up and kind of high fidelity uh, uh, manipulation. So, so this is, for example, you can prepare the states up, up, down, up, down, up, down, and up, down, up, and, uh, and for the eight atoms. Uh, but actually one I would like to kind of emphasize is that, you know, basically this technique works through a series of kind of controlled diabetic transition. And if you would actually um, convert it into equivalent circuit, you know, this uh, would result in a kind of circuit uh, depth times number of atoms of product of around 200 without making any single error. So you can, for example, estimate what's kind of probability of gate error in our system based on that. And so with techniques like this, you know, here are some results for uh, 20 atoms. So basically uh, uh, this is a probability of all states. So we have about, you know, a million states and, you know, this blue are raw uh, uh, probabilities measured. So 
We also know that you know, in our system, the measurement has some errors. So it's actually the errors in this measurement was kind of around uh, maybe one and a half percent um, uh, per uh, atom. And you know, by quantifying this measurement errors, we can then infer what actual the actual probabilities which we prepared. These are these yellow uh, bars, and we can also uh, and you know, this actually uh, other ways to quantify. So, for example, these are experimentally measured correlations between all of these twenty atoms. So it's basically kind of you see that these correlations are basically non-decaying. But what we can also do, we can also now um, uh, control the phase of the state by applying the staggered field and then measuring the parity. And basically from these two quantities, we can just um, you know, infer the fidelity. And what we see is indeed as, uh, as we measure fidelity for larger and larger number of atoms, the fidelity you know, uh, uh, decreases, but still for 20 atoms, we measure, we have find that our state is entangled. And, you know, this actually is the largest GLG state created in a kind of programmable system uh, 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 today. Uh, but, you know, I think there are many opportunities to improve it. And it's actually, we're continuing some of this work. So we know our main sources of noise. It's a laser phase noise. We'd like to deploy optimal control uh, loop. I also mentioned something about it at the end. And we're also exploring various kind of echo and, you know, and technology improvement uh, procedure. So at the end, what we'd like to do is use the system to understand dynamics, robustness, distribution of entanglement, and perhaps even use of uh, this such entanglement to improve um, atomic clocks. Uh, okay, so where, you know, what are we doing now? So where is this going? So we have a number of exciting uh, directions which we are kind of working on. So I don't really have time to talk about all of this, but I'll give you a little bit of kind of a sneak peek into what's coming. So, you know, one direction is really to try to increase the system size and, you know, and, and control to, you know, systems succeeding, you know, hundred, uh, hundreds of, 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 of qubits. Uh, and, you know, uh, the way how uh, this is done is by basically upgrading the uh, existing experimental apparatus. So, uh, instead of acoustic deflectors in our second generation, what we are doing is we're using special light mod mod modulators. So, it's essentially a hologram that you can use to kind of deflect the laser beam and you can actually kind of uh, by uh, creating an appropriate pattern, you can create um, arrays of beams in two spatial dimensions, uh, which, you know, then you can focus in this um, uh, 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 vacuum uh, system and, you know, create arrays like this. So it's actually a thousand of traps, which are extremely homogeneous and this based on a square um, uh, lattice arrangement. And uh, what we do is we load atoms into them and when we need to sort them and the way how we sort them is by using uh, two crossed acoustic deflectors. So we basically can, instead of just moving them along one um, uh, 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 line, we just now can move them uh, you know, everywhere in, in two spatial dimensions. So, and uh, basically this all can be you know, controlled with, uh, with AWG. So here is uh, some, first tries where we create about 600 uh, uh, traps and then load them. And in this case, you know, as you see again, the loading is uh, uh, probabilistic uh, and each trap is in a given shot is loaded with about 60% uh, probability. So what we would like to do next is we would like to basically, and it's loaded also pretty fast. So it's actually loaded a little bit, you know, faster than what I'm kind of showing you on, that, on, uh, on, on this animation. So, so what we can now ask is, can we feel, you know, let's say 300 uh, um, sites. So here are some attempts. So here is initial loading and here is an after sorting. And again, I'll show you as a kind of a movie. What you see is that this loading is working pretty well. It's not yet completely perfect. So you can see error uh, you know, uh, once in a while. So actually right now, each single trap is loaded, uh, you know, uh, with the 99% probability. But of course you put 99 to, to the power of 300, you will see, you know, some errors, but you know, nevertheless, you know, we still already have, can have with high probability load, basically perfect arrays. And uh, of course, this is, uh, here is an example of the, square lattice, but you know, by no means we are limited by square lattice. We can create any arrangement. In fact, 
we can create arbitrary patterns. So here is, for example, a desired pattern, uh, which we would like to create. And you know, here is the experimental image where we create a desired atomic pattern. Okay, so what can we do with system like this? So um, our interests are twofold. So what, first off, we would like to do quantum simulations. We would like to explore exotic spin systems and we would like to implement uh, quantum algorithms. So let me give you a little bit of, of a sneak peek into both of these directions. So uh, in the first uh, uh, project, what we are doing is we're exploring new phases uh, uh, in uh, two-dimensional square lattice. So um, uh, here is our Hamiltonian, which we used already for one-dimensional system. And so basically, you know, what you could do now, you can start adjusting blockade. So for example, if you focus uh, on this interaction term, if you have like a short range blockade, so then uh, you will not be able to excite all of the atoms in Rydberg state, but you should be able to excite like every other uh, uh, one of them. And that we should create this kind of checkerboard phase, you know, so this transition into the state should be a Ising to the Ising uh, phase transition. But if you now start playing, for example, with interaction range, with blockade range, then it turns out there is a cool zoo of the, of, of the phases. So in fact, you know, with this long range interactions, this actually becomes a frustrated system. So some of these phases are actually very exotic, very unusual, like the straighted phase, for example, here. And, you know, um, uh, basically uh, about a year ago, we kind of together with Subir and one of his students, we actually worked out a phase diagram um, and uh, what we can now do is explore it experimentally. So uh, note that you know this phase diagram is actually quite so quite complex. So there are some very interesting zoo phases can be um, uh, observed. But actually, even this two-dimensional Ising quantum phase transition, it turns out, has never been observed experimentally. So in, in, in no other system. And so that's maybe the simplest uh, phase. So let's just try to basically try to see if we can see this Ising QPT on this uh, square lattice. So what we'll do is we'll do the same thing as we did for 1D system. We'll start with all atoms in the ground state and just try to adiabatically enter this, this phase. So uh, here is the arrangement. So we fix a Rydberg blockade and basically you know, uh, do this transfer and what we see is actually, a, you know, not perfect, uh, uh, not perfectly ordered the system, but the system orders pretty nicely, pretty, it, it orders pretty well. So uh, we can quantify this ordering in several different ways. And for example, you know, one thing is we could do is we could just plot density density correlation. And what you see is that basically at this point, you know, the system is ordered, you know, uh, across a big chunk of the entire sort of uh, uh, array uh, dimension. So for example, we can, you know, just looking at one cut at the cut along y direction, we can see that, you know, this correlation length is around like six sides. So it means that it basically is correlated from minus six to plus six. So it's actually correlated across nearly the entire array. And uh, one can uh, then now study, you know, this phase transition, for example, by looking at this correlation length as a function of their sweep rate, you know, and this is how one can study, for example, things like kibble zurich mechanism. So here you just change the tuning, the different rate across this phase transition. And, and this is some of a very early preliminary data, but we can see already some very nice scaling. And actually, if we extract scaling exponent, it turns out to be very, very close to the um, uh, to predictions from like the Ising universality class. You know? And so basically, uh, uh, we believe that we really have now, you know, kind of observed for the first time this Ising quantum phase transition in two dimensions. And actually, there are many other opportunities, you know, for uh, probing uh, different types of exotic states. So I think we are just, you know, starting on that, you know, stay tuned. Just one last thing I'd like to kind of point uh, out is the connection between these studies and um, uh, things like quantum optimization. So in order to explain that, let me kind of remind you um, uh, uh, about one uh, kind of paradigmatic uh, optimization problem called maximum independent set in which you are given a graph uh, with vertices and edges. And the idea is, and basically independent set is the subset of these vertices, uh, you know, for example, those which are colored by red. 
such that you know no two colored uh, vertices has are connected by one edge. So for example, what's shown here is an example of independent set. An MIS problem you know, consists of finding the largest independent set. So it's one of these problems which is very easy to formulate, but it's actually very hard to solve. So what is shown here you know, is an example of MIS on one specific graph. It's called UniGIS graph, and which vertices are connected if they are within a given distance. So this is a so-called UniGIS graph. And actually, it turns out you know, both MIS and in particular this UniGIS graph um, uh, is actually a very important problem. It has many real world applications, design of networks, uh, machine learning. Uh, actually, you know, by looking, by hearing Google's talk, so it actually looks like maybe of this tuning of, you know, qubits and superconducting quantum com computer might be one, you know, related to this, um, uh, to this optimization problem. But so this once again is a simple kind of very generic optimization problem, but it's actually the problem which is hard to solve. So, you know, so it is actually an P-complete problem, even uh, finding exact um, MAC MIS for this unit disk graph, it turns out to be an P-complete. Now, if you listen, you know, closely to my talk, you know, then we would realize that there is immediate direct connection between this um, uh, MIS uh, problem and the Rydberg blockade. So specifically, uh, you know, if you are trying to excite the atoms under the Rydberg blockade, you'd like to excite as many atoms as possible, but you are not able, allowed to excite and refill this blockade radius. So it actually turns out that this MIS, you know, on this unit disk in particular, is corresponds to the ground state of blockade Hamilton. And the question is, you know, uh, can we now use our platform to try to basically, you know, look, you know, try to use quantum kind of hardware to improve optimization. So the ideas which we would like to kind of explore um, involve both adiabatic evolution, you know, but also uh, things like QAA. And, you know, for both of them, there is a prior work, um, uh, uh, but the question is how well will, will this will perform in a kind of large scale coherent system. So here are some examples. So uh, in this example, we start um, uh, uh, with the unit this graph on a square lattice uh, uh, with edges connecting nearest and next nearest neighbor. And you know this is a corresponding graph, so it's a, you know still a relatively small problem, so you can solve it exactly. You can find maximum dependent set, and the way how we will actually uh, implement this in uh, uh, in our system is we simply will you know uh, assemble the atomic arrangement corresponding you know basically to the one on the left, and just adjust the Rydberg blockade to you know basically you know implement the desired connectivity. And then what we need to do is simply, you know, try to basically find the low energy or ground state, you know, uh, 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 system somehow, right? And hope that it's close to the, um, uh, to the MIS. And so in this example, what you see is that it's pretty good, but not perfect, you know? So let's now look how it works. So there are two approaches to this. One is to use something like annealing, but actually we can do better because our system is coherent. So we can use this quasi-adiabatic sweep. So here is one example where we basically just you know, fix the parameters of the sweep and just try to kind of look at you know, what kind of uh, independent sets you create. And what we have done is uh, kind of uh, use this um, one uh, sequence with one timing on different uh, uh, system sizes. So here is an example of uh, 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 49, uh, uh, 39 vertices. So largest, uh, so exact MS is 12 and you know, we find it in quite a reasonable number of, uh, of cases. So for 80, we see, we still find it, but it kind of decreases and, 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 and for 180, we also find it, but it's already a probability is quite small. So uh, at this point, you know, we are just starting. So for sweep fix sweep time, we see the probability to find uh, MIS scales exponentially, but we have not yet deployed all of these techniques, for example, which we use to create a GG state. And this is what we are trying to do now to basically use optimal control, closed loop optimization and so on. What we can also do is we can run our system in a kind of more gate mode and a more digital mode. And so actually, 
to implement um, uh, QRA, it turns out we can just use a sequential application of blockade Hamiltonian. And the control parameters here is the duration of this Hamiltonian and also the phase of this, of this driving field. And so here we start with a relatively small problem, just 35 uh, uh, vertices and my exact MIS here is, is 12. And you know the step with the step one, it actually doesn't matter which phase you use, but basically what you do, you just perform this kind of quench uh, experiment where you just turn the Hamiltonian for certain time and you see that there is basically an optimal time here. So you can you can fix this time and you know you can try to see uh, what is you know what are the solutions. So here we cannot quite find the MIS uh, still, you know, because it's we know it's 12. We can actually increase the circuit depth, you know, and uh, go to uh, uh, to p equals two. And actually, you know, at this point, you know, this is one of the first tries we have made. We just change, pick the phase, different phase, uh, change the phase uh, by pi over two. And actually, what you see is, in fact, you know, uh, it already improves performance a little bit, you know. Still, at the end, the performance is not as good as, as uh, this quasi-adiabatic speed. But then again, we have not really done, um, you know, uh, very much optimization. And in fact, this is uh, what uh, we are working on now. So, uh, so we are uh, trying to kind of um, uh, look at, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, finding optimized kind of optimized angle setting also developing closed loop optimization strategies and that and actually also trying to do uh, kind of more rigorous quantum classical uh, benchmarking. But, you know, I think there are a lot of also opportunities here, you know, including also both uh, classical and quantum error correction going beyond unit disk problems. And also we have some ideas how to uh, utilize this approach for sampling. I think I have used up my time. Let me just point out that, you know, uh, over the last couple of years, there are also a number of new experiments involving Rydberg arrays, you know, utilizing exotic atoms and actually, you know, all of them are doing really cool work, which kind of, you know, really covers a broad frontier from many body dynamics to quantum computing and, and metrology. And so kind of stay tuned for, for new results. So I think I used up my time. Uh, um, so, and you know, here is a summary of my talk, and here is actually a great group of, of people uh, whose blood and sweat resulted in all of these things which I showed you, and here is a little entertainment for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Misha, thank you very much. So, so are there questions? I had a brief question. You mentioned that the um, <clears throat> the maximally independent set uh, uh, that it's a um, MP hard problem on the um, on the general class of graphs, which yeah. was uh, graphs where vertices are separated by. Oh, sorry, they're connected if they're separated by like less than a certain amount of distance. Mm -hmm. But is that also is it still MP MP hard when you've uh, when you restrict the graph um, vertices to be on the square lattice as you've done here? Yes, it turns out it is. Yes, so yeah, so this, okay. this unit, this graph, so it turns out that to find, so kind of general MIS problem for a general graph is NP hard and also to find an efficient approximation as NP hard. So mm -hmm. this unit, Thanks. these graphs, these restricted graphs, actually they are, the exact solutions is still in p-hard, uh, but uh, it turns out what one can have efficient approximation. And actually, potentially, this might be kind of not a bad problem to start with, because maybe one could see if quantum, you know, for example, uh, you know, uh, optimization can improve uh, approximation ratios and stuff like that. And that's what we are trying to do now. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Misha. Um, this is Amish. So, very nice talk. Uh, I, I had a quick question. So, uh, uh, let's say that, you know, if it was much, uh, if you could do certain computational things uh, with about the same number of qubits, 600 to 1,000, but you needed a 3D lattice, mm -hmm. is, that, is that sort of easy or impossible? You know, how hard would it be to get there? Yeah, so yeah, there are, it's a very good question. So there are two ways. Uh, 
So, so we believe that a step from 1D to 2D is kind of a big step because it you know allows kind of to expand the class of problems kind of significantly. So in principle, you know, you can also assemble 3D uh, arrays of atoms mm -hmm. and, you know, and this has actually has been done. Maybe not with the same degree of control yet, but, you know, it certainly is possible. But the other, you know, thing which I want to point out is that, you know, um, and you, as I hope you have seen is that basically we are not in our um, sort of um, uh, models we are not restricted to nearest neighbor interactions. Mm -hmm. And so in principle, like even in a system which I showed here with these 300 atoms, we can engineer ne nearly all, you know, all to all interactions by choosing the you know, specific kind of set of pulses, right? So, and at this point is, you know, it doesn't matter what's the kind of dimensionality of the, of, of the system. So I think both of these approaches are possible and actually, you know, probably long range interactions might be even easier in a, in a relatively short run, but, you know, but also you can certainly do 3D also. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, if you do the 3D, can you, can you have all the, you know, say all nearest neighbor interactions turned on simultaneously? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the only, the more the technically, you know, for example, this 3D lattice, It'll probably be uh, a little bit more challenging to uh, uh, to kind of you know feel and also to image, but you know in principle everything the rest of the physics is all the same. Okay, yeah. great. So there is somebody asking a question that, uh, to my understanding, readout is currently completely destructive. Do you foresee a solution to this, or would one rely? upon a reservoir of sacrificial and sealers. Yeah, so yeah, one can do, in fact, yeah, both of these, the, the answer is yes on both. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are, you know, on one hand, we can have this additional unsealers, which we can bring in, you know, and you've seen in some of the images, but actually it turns out that you can use this blockade mechanism also for very efficient Q and D readout. And uh, which actually, in addition to being Q and D, can be much, much faster. So I would say that, you know, like at a high level, the weakest part of both ion and atom approach is that the readout is slow. It can be very good, but, you know, it's certainly in our case, we can do gates, you know, we can do gates practically at a gigahertz speed. But to do the readout, it, you know, requires, um, you know, kind of millisecond, you know, typically you need to collect these photons. Uh, and, this ad, and this other approach, which actually we're just finishing a paper on this. So in this other approach, what we do, we basically use um, small ensembles of atoms to read out. And the idea is that, you know, if you basically have, you know, one single Rydberg atom in a, uh, you know, in a Rydberg state, it can actually block transmission through this through this cloud of, of, of nearby cloud of atoms. So, and in this kind of final architecture, one could imagine that there could be basically some, you know, uh, kind of individual arrays, like individual atoms as shown here, and will be interspersed by these kind of little clouds of atoms, which kind of act like trans transducers for it out. And um, in the, in the and of, okay, so these things have to still be developed, but, you know, basically in a recent experiment, we have seen, kind of 95 or so uh, percent success probability, Q and D read out within 10 microseconds, thousand times faster than, than the usual techniques. So I think it's a very promising approach also. So I have another question and it's related a little bit to the other talks. So you uh, have mentioned this wonderful experiment now with uh, hundreds of atoms in two dimensions and then you have been able to see this phase diagram and so on. And I'm wondering to what extent for that particular result do you need 200 atoms or 300 atoms? Could you have done the same thing with 53? Could you have done that with Google's quantum computer? Well, it's, well, okay, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, but at some point, for example, what we see for these simulations is that, you know, the edge effects 
are, for example, much more severe in two dimensions, right? Because, for example, you know, 100 atoms, you know, in one dimension, right, the edges, you almost don't feel them, right? But, you know, like 100 atoms in two dimension or has only a linear dimension of, of 10, you know, and actually, in fact, we are still trying to understand, for example, the limits correlation lengths and so on. And what we see is that this, the edge effects, even for our system size, are very, very important. So the question uh, is that you need many atoms for that. For exactly. So you need you need many, you need, yeah. I, I do think that you need hundreds of atoms to have at least a shot at extracting things like thermodynamic quantities and so on. And and you know, also in particular, if you start looking at more exotic states like spin liquids and so on, which have entanglement, there I can imagine that this also this edges will be very, very important and how you know edge, you know. So edge states and things like this. I think besides all the stuff that people think about Majoranas, for example, they would like to have edges, right? Well separated. Yeah, so. Okay, any other question? Okay, this, um, this does not seem to be the case. And so let's uh, thank uh, Misha again for his talk and all the speakers of these sessions for these wonderful talks. And Misha, you have some time. There are some questions that you may answer online so in, the frequent, in, the, in the Zoom. Okay. Right. And otherwise, I will just say, uh, 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 please come back tomorrow for Theory Thursday. We have a, a Theory Wednesday, excuse me. We have a slightly shorter program today, but uh, equally high quality. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day, afternoon, evening, night.